So, um, UCREO, New Development European Chronic Standby Stabilization and Transport. Some of you will be um, aware of it already. Uh, not everybody here will be a native English speaker, so we do have the um, website and what have you in all European languages. That's technically a lie, we're actually waiting on a replacement Lithuanian translation because the first one wasn't too good, but uh, we've got all the rest there. You can either just put the two letters at the end or um, click on flex, which um, uh, you can see in the top right hand corner of the website looks like that for translations. On, it, on the website you find a lot of information and uh, will be a reason that I can probably skip through quite some things here um, in the interest of proceeding to the uh, speakers. Um, most of you already know about me and what I do because I've made a number of presentations quite recently in the UK and in Germany and in Brussels. Um, so some of you may be less aware of the CEO, uh, one of the other main people behind UCREO. Uh, that is a man by the name of Nuno Martins. Uh, some of you may know him from Singularity University. Um, he was there in the inaugural year, which means um, very, uh, very few people out of very many uh, applicants got to uh, attend with a scholarship, and he did. He was on the business course. So some people ask me a lot of business questions about UCREO and UCREO's uh, business plan setup, etc. Um, frankly, it's mostly Nuno who handles all that side of things for uh, UCREO. I just handle pragmatisms mainly. Uh, he has also had several successful businesses before and he um, has used those businesses to fund his uh, PhD in nanomedicine. So uh, I have a lot of confidence in him and it's uh, certainly a great pleasure working with him. So uh, Europe, one of the reasons that we went ahead and did this project with UCRO is when we were first introduced to each other last December we came to realize that we really did not have what we needed in uh, Europe regards to standby stabilization transport and that cryonesis in Europe was simply not getting to where they needed to be. Now there's um, 200 cryonesists uh, or more in Europe, about 10% of the world. Um, no professional standby stabilization teams, only one volunteer standby stabilization team that's uh, specifically uh, Cryonics UK. Let me just move to the side so that I can see my own slides. Correct. And um, there is a low awareness of what needs to happen in an emergency. Most people don't know what needs to happen when the proverbial hits the fan. And there are costs involved, even if people have made no preparations as yet in order to get where they need to be, not so in America, whereby um, this is more inclusive within the fee. Um, and hence, it's almost always a straight freeze at best from Europe. Um, frankly, many European cryonists don't even get that much and end up being buried or cremated, which is not what any of us want. So um, what is it that we do specifically? I'll try and go through this part quite quickly because um, some of you all know about this already. Um, time is the enemy and cryonics needs to um, basically overcome that problem. So with standby we put the people and equipment near the patient and uh, negotiate with an assisted family and facility personnel that is to say, we need to make sure that everything can run smoothly. Um, for that reason, we monitor the patient condition and ensure that um, we can know as well as we possibly can when a patient is likely to deanimate based on palliative care statistics. Um, we make sure any paperwork is attended to, so not bureaucratic delays. Also, recently I was at Cryonics Institute headquarters and um, uh, assisted with a suspension there of a fellow who was signed up post-mortem and in fact I sat at the table with the son of the patient while the son was busy filling out the patient's um, membership documents. Now that's an extreme example of last minute um, but even people who think they have all the documents covered very often don't actually have them all covered to make sure that anything's uh, sorted. And uh, preparing the very physical um, transportation requirements, packing requirements, things like that. Uh, bureaucracy and pragmatisms. So stabilization is the uh, most important part and is the kind of beefiest part of what we do. Um, time is still the enemy even once a patient actually dies and heat is obviously the enemy. Heat and cryonics don't go well hand in hand so we need to reduce and prevent ischemic damage and cell death. By ischemic damage I mean the damage that is caused by a lack of blood flow um, which is considerable and we definitely need to try and avoid it. To that end we use a lot of medications which most Europeans don't get and uh, we need to restore homeostasis. Body pH for example drops very rapidly shortly after death 
and uh, all the other bodies, uh, parts of the body's homeostatic system will cease to function somewhere. Uh, cardiac support, we uh, continue that because otherwise the medications aren't going to circulate and additionally, um, otherwise clots are going to form horrendously. Um, we do a lot of monitoring and recording drug stabilization, partly to cover ourselves, show that we're doing our jobs properly, but additionally so that the field can progress. Things don't progress if you don't record, measure and improve. We do wash out, that means washing out the body's blood and perfusion with a vitrification solution. Uh, at least we do that, not everybody does that, but Nucreo does. Vitrification, why it's so important? A lot of people say your brain will be a mush on cryonics and uh, all the ice formation will happen is going to cause horrendous damage. This is um, the brain of Thomas Sullivan, uh, who's the father of Matthew Sullivan, who's a friend of mine and works at Suspended Animation in the United States, kindly gave me permission to use this image. The brain that you can see there is, um, it looks like it's just sitting in uh, perhaps a little strange pool of water or something. In fact, it's sitting in a pool of liquid nitrogen and you can see that around the edges of the container there's a lot of uh, crystallization of ice crystals. But the brain itself, where the brain is, no ice crystals whatsoever. Why? Because the brain was very nicely perfused with vitrification solutions. So that's what we do as well. Uh, however, right now, it's not that rosy for Europeans. Uh, Europeans aren't getting that right now. Um, right now, people are getting no perfusion with vitrification solutions. That brain picture would look very different. It would look very white and frosty and much like a piece of meat you've kept in your freezer, which is horrendous. No cooling and portable ice bath, no post-mortem cardiac support. Uh, no standby team likely to be called, let alone guaranteed to attend. And no doctor at bedside ready to pronounce legal death in a timely fashion, uh, which makes a big difference. No post-mortem insertion of medications, anticoagulants being uh, most important, but there's a long list. The list looks like this. Um, I shan't take your time up with going through each of these. However, if anybody wants more specific information about any of them or why they're so important, I'd be happy to field questions um, if people want to ask me questions. Uh, if not, we can always just move on. The medications, however, do make a huge difference. And if you don't get them, there are so many things where your body is going to change immediately after death that you really don't want to happen. Uh, you see somebody maybe 20 minutes, half an hour after death, and you're starting to get liver mortis very quickly, then rigor mortis not long after liver mortis, and the inside is even worse when the gut flora starts to um, be reproducing in a very unchecked fashion. That is why um, somebody who's been dead for a couple of hours will be very bloated and gassy, and really there's a lot of horrendous things happening that basically will precipitate the onset of putrefaction, which we do not want in a cryonics patient. So yeah, if you're not getting these, you have a problem. Uh, so yeah, your brain's decidedly left out in the cold. Uh, with no prearranged dry ice transport, which is pretty critical, and no country by country legal support. Many people in many countries do not know their own laws regards to cryonics because there are not laws regards to cryonics. There are simply laws that affect cryonics uh, with one or two exceptions in the world, but nobody in Europe has any um, actual laws regarding cryonics, contrary to what you may have heard. Uh, so yeah, good luck Europeans. Um, I use this slide here, a little bit of humor, but also I actually find it quite emotive. Uh, the idea that no help should come to somebody who is in critical need of it, somebody does not want to die, and they're gonna die, that's um, very important to me that that help should be given. So I will not, by my inaction, allow somebody to die who didn't need to be, which is really why we got involved in this with UCRO, because we realized that, well, are we the best qualified people to do it? And you might argue that out of the various people in Europe with various levels of experience in different fields, um, we may well be the best people to do it who actually got involved in this project. You may argue maybe we're not the best people in the world best equipped to do it. Maybe there are more Maybe there is more expertise in the United States, etc. Well, certainly there is, but they're not here and they're not doing it and they have no plans of doing it in Europe. In fact, um, I checked with Catherine Baldwin, who's my counterpart, the general manager of Suspended Animation, back in January, where the Suspended Animation planned to move into Europe. And she confirmed to me at that time that they had no plans, but that they'd be happy to assist us with setting something such as Ukraine up, which uh, we've been very glad of their assistance. 
Um, so how UQRIO changes it? Well, uh, lots of people in lots of places. Uh, people are asking us, how many staff do you have for these teams? Well, individually recruited, we only have around 15 um, ad hoc staff so far. We need lots more than that, two per position per team. So two multiplied by six multiplied by 28, which is the number of countries means lots of people. But until we have that full level of recruitment, we're using agency staff. So for example, um, you can find doctors and medics and people like that that we need that, and embalmers as well that we can get simply on demand. Instead of re needing a specific person, we simply call the agency and say, we need a doctor, we need a medic, we need an embalmer, whatever that agency supplies. We need it in Prague in three hours time. They say, right, we'll send this person straight away. So that's the arrangement we have. Um, Meds kits are uh, stocked with lots of important medications. That's the list I've just given you. And the med support kits and equipment needed to insert them promptly, safely, efficiently. And the world's most technologically advanced automated cardiac support system, which we're very proud of. Um, yeah, we have unprecedented technology for rapid cooling due to intravenous cooling right from the start. We cool our patients from the inside straight away, not just from the outside. And dry ice availability and transport capability wherever and wherever we need it. We have vitrification capabilities. We have a biochemist who makes VM1 for us. Uh, we have lawyers advising us in every European country. And we cover in a very rigorous protocol as many things as we are able to foresee, taking into account the past experiences of other organizations that have done the same thing. That is to say, Cryonix UK in a volunteer capacity has handled not many suspensions, but a few. And suspended animation has handled the, uh, the ones that it has as well. Um, plus any that Alcor have handled basically going off on the old um, uh, protocols. Oh, I see that some people have problems seeing slides. Um, if people could just mention in the text chat, yes or no, do you see my slides? Have you been seeing them? Okay, if you would, if it's, you see something saying fetching, then that kind of suggests that your own computer is fetching this information. Um, alas, I don't think there's much that I can do about this. Can you see my webcam feed? Okay, those of you who can't, so those of you who cannot see the slides, can you see the webcam feed? Okay. Okay, right, so that means that bullet points, I'm afraid you might as well. Um, it looks like you're just going to miss out on, I'm afraid. But anything that's particularly graphic or image-wise, um, I will conjure up my presentation on my trusty iPad here, and uh, I simply <laughs> hold it up and you can see it. Um, so the picture that I mentioned earlier of Tom Sullivan's brain looked like that. So right at the side, uh, you can see the frosty bits, and in the middle, you can uh, see that the brain itself has no frosty parts. I'm kind of afraid to put my fingers over it in case it touches something and moves it on, but uh, you can see at the edges there it's all frosty and whereas the brain itself really isn't. Um, that's indicating the lack of ice formation and why it'll have a good um, uh, good chance of reanimation compared to somebody who has a, a horrid amount of ice crystallization in there. So I'm just broadly going to Leave that down and just hold it up when you've got something easy to see. Right. So, uh, meanwhile, bullet points for those who can see them and for those who can't, um, I'm afraid you just have me talking for the moment. Um, we provide all support possible to make our services as affordable as possible for all. One of my items in my job description is to assist people uh, to get cryonics in general. You know, if you don't want UQRIO services, but you want to make cryonics arrangements with CI or with Cryorus or Alcor, but you're in Europe and they don't have the specific information to help you as well as we might be able to with our information and our resources, then it's my job without any obligation or cost to you to uh, basically assist you however I can. So I will be sure to do that. Um, Staff, how it works. Yeah, team members employed ad hoc on demand contractors paid only when being used because otherwise we'll have a hell of a lot of salaries and that would make UQRIO far too expensive for most people to afford. 
two people per position per team per country. And the full-time staff is minimal. And some full-time staff, um, like my secretary, uh, for example, is actually seconded to UCREO from other businesses. So basically working for UCREO full-time, but not being paid by it. So that's another way that we've managed to keep our overheads quite low so that we can make it as affordable as possible. Um, right, so Zon Auto Pulse, um, which is actually this device you can see behind me here, um, I've got sitting in my office, um, is the most advanced cardiac um, support system around and it can operate indefinitely, powered by rechargeable batteries, so no messing around with um, oxygen cylinders and what have you. It's additionally much more lightweight, easy to use. In fact, if I pick this up and show you, which I have a slide to show you, but for those who can't see the slides, you can at least see on the webcam that this is a pretty mobile and easy to use uh, device, which for any familiar with the Michigan Instruments 1004 Thumper, which is what most people have, or the 1007 Thumper, which is a bit different, and Lucas Instruments Thumper, uh, it's certainly a hell of a lot easier to transport that thing than those. For those who can see slides, that's uh, Michigan Instruments Thumper. For those who can't see the slides, uh, whoops, looks a bit like that. Um, no, that's an Epicardio pump. I seem to have advanced it a bit. Okay. That's a thumper, which some of you may be familiar with. If not, then you can always just um, Google and you'll see images that way. Um, next one up, the Amber Cardio Pump, which is the plan C for cardiopulmonary support. We actually have the Michigan Instruments thumpers as well as a backup, a plan B. This is the plan C, which requires no um, electricity or compressed air. And it has pressure guards against over compression or under compression, and it has suction for recompression. But as you can see, it's just a, um, a handheld device. Sorry, I'm getting mildly confused about the direction I move my hands because the video feed is flipping things for me. Um, but you can see it there. To be honest, if I'd have known that slides wouldn't show, I would actually have uh, brought the equipment that is still uh, here and not at the headquarters, which is why I'm not in my office, which is not the same as my place at the headquarters, uh, and then I could just show and tell. Uh, meds kits, at least two uh, meds kits ready for use at any given time. The meds are arranged and numbered in order of assertion, insertion, and the items that are needed together are packed together. And uh, yeah, was, the previous slide was actually showing um, the suspended animation meds kits, which is because they're our supplier, which was when I put the presentation together, I didn't have the actual ones yet, but ours look like that, because um, yellow is the colour clinical stuff over here rather than um, rather than the uh, Orange of America. Oh, hello, uh, Eugene and Robert again. I see you've uh, see you've reappeared. Uh, next item upon the uh, equipment list: uh, Thomas Chilcore case, which is specially designed for introducing clinical hypothermia. And um, it can show IV bags, bottles, etc. So that when they go into um, the patient's body, they're already um, they're already being chilled from the inside, which is so much more rapid and so much more efficient than being chilled from the outside alone. Um, inserting medications—it's actually very difficult to put medications into a deceased person because they lack blood pressure, um, even if you're trained in doing so. Uh, which incidentally, for any who may not be aware, I, um, I was trained as a paramedic uh, in the army. I actually then never practiced and consequently I'm not registered as a paramedic, but nevertheless I was trained, I completed the qualification. And um, yeah, for a patient without blood pressure, it's very, very difficult. So we use this device instead, a fast one intraosseous infuser, which makes the IV access easy, even in a post-mortem patient. And um, thus it gives rapid access to both sides of the uh, or both halves of the patient's cardiovascular system because it goes straight into the bone marrow. Um, I see for some reason the version of my presentation on my uh, iPad, for some reason the other, the image on the other side of this, there should be an image just uh, here, but for some reason it's not showing on my iPad so I can't show you that. 
Uh, but nevertheless, it does make things much more rapid and means very safe. Uh, yeah, there's me inserting um, and inserting meds just with a dummy using a setup in one of our training things. Intubation kit. Uh, we have a range of Valorian scope blades to fit any patient and combat tube. Combat tube is a fascinating piece of kit which allows one to put uh, fluids into the stomach and uh, gases into the lungs without putting gases into the stomach or fluids into the lungs, which is pretty vital. Interestingly, nurses and paramedics who don't work in cryonics but actually work up on living patients uh, are actually very often trained for the first time to do this using uh, really deceased patients. So it's very useful that the people that we employ to do this, medics, have actually already been trained to do this on deceased patients, which is fantastic. Um, portable ice bath, probably one of the most um, crucial pieces of kit. And uh, begins the water, uh, water ice cooling process from the outside. And it's uh, very portable, as the name suggests. And in case of ours, has been rigorously tested. Uh, possible ice bath possibly has to say the most important piece of field kit. Um, the Ucrea one, the main one that we have for the Iberian Peninsula, not air transportable, is a very sturdy and robust piece that uh, will disassemble relatively easily. It looks like that hole and that split in half. Uh, so they can be transported in a vehicle. We have uh, air transportable ones for um, more remote standbys that aren't in the Iberian Peninsula and basically in the rest of Europe, uh, which don't look quite as shiny and pretty as this, but they do the job well. Uh, ice in Mediterranean countries, uh, possibly not so much a problem, but or in many places in America, but in Northern Europe, etc., it can be a real difficulty to get water ice for the ice bath, which would be very, very embarrassing if we couldn't do a proper stabilization for a lack of ice. The media would have a field day with that. So uh, we take, um, well, we have 180 of these, which is an instant ice pack ready to go anytime. So it's basically, it's a um, combination of chemicals inside that when you crush it with your hand, uh, simply becomes very, very cold, very, very rapidly. And, um, can be used in place of water ice in the ice bath. Um, yeah, the, the dry ice shipper in this image, for those who can see the slides, is actually a Chronix UK one. Ours is just waiting for us to collect it at the moment because it's only just been built, but it's been built to the same specifications, so for all intents and purposes, this is it. Uh, our dry ice shipper can maintain a patient temperature of minus 79 degrees Celsius for several weeks. Um, however, we don't intend the patient to stay more than two or three days inside. But 